and we'll be good to go here. All right. So we can all do algebra when it comes to our, and Google doesn't like my formatting on this. Um, let me clean that up real quick. I really don't want to have to start using Google Slides to make my slides because Google Slides is all. Uh, there we go, that's a little bit better. All right. So, as, as mentioned, temperature change is pretty straightforward when it comes to Q, right? Anytime you've got something changing temperature, it's really easy. As long as you know the specific heat, it's pretty, pretty easy to figure out how much energy is going into that system or is leaving that system. We might have to get a little creative with how we measure it, like we're doing with our calorimetry lab from yesterday. But the actual math is not all that tricky, right? Um, so let's add a new wrinkle to it. It turns out more than just heat transfer can be caused by more than just um, something hot comes into contact with something cold. Turns out there's lots of different, you know, any chemical reaction is going to have a change in energy as well, and which is generally why the reaction happens in the first place is because usually it means the reaction is going from something unstable to something more stable. And in doing so, that change in energy between less stable and more stable gets given to the surroundings as heat. So we represent this graphically uh, a lot of times in chemistry classes with what's called a potential energy surface. So it's just like potential energy. Calling it a surface is really, um, I don't know, it's too generous, but it, it makes it sound trickier than it is. Potential energy surface just means we're going to look at over the course of a reaction, what happens to the energy of the chemicals. So in general, they're going to look something like this. You're going to start in this, at a state that's less, that's high energy. And then our x-axis is just what we call reaction coordinate, or basically how, you know, as the reaction progresses. Um, the shorthand for reaction for chemists is Rxn, short for reaction, um, if you haven't seen that before. But typically what's going to happen is you're going to go from a high energy state, you have to go through some barrier, and then you wind up at a lower energy state than where you started. And the difference in energy between those two states, well, that energy has to go somewhere, right? That's the energy that causes a temperature change in the surroundings. So if, if it's drawn the way I have it drawn here, where you start at high energy from the point of view of the react of the um, chemicals and you end at lower energy, what's gonna happen to the surroundings in terms of temperature? Heat up. If the chemicals dropped in energy, the energy is being given to the surroundings. So if we think about the change in energy for the chemicals is being negative. That means it's energy given to the surroundings and temperature increases. Um, and we can actually calculate that and we can use our Q equation now to predict what the temperature change is going to be um, for a chemical reaction. Now, the simplest chemical reactions are ones that we usually don't even classify as chemical reactions, right? This, these were one of our examples of physical changes. Um, but phase change has energy associated with it. It's a little weird to think about until we start thinking about, um, go back to you know, those, that concert analogy, right? To get from a classical music to a mosh pit, you have to add energy to the system. To go through those phase changes, you have to change the energy of the system. Um, and so the... the this is a figure that's, that is useful for um, defining what the various phase changes are. You already know most of what they are, but just in their, um, their scientific terms, 
melting and freezing. Actually, that, that kind of is the technical term, although you do see fusion being used for freezing as well. Um, they just have to, you just have to be careful that you're keeping it separate from, it's not nuclear fusion. Um, it's a fusion of phase change, which is why you typically just say freezing instead. Um, and vaporization and condensation. You guys are familiar with those. A lot of times we call vaporization evaporation, but it's the same thing. Then there's these other ones. And I'm going to bring back that phase diagram that I used the other day when we were talking about phases. And once again, I have to think hard about which one is the pressure and which one's the temperature. Low temperature, high, yeah, okay. Pressure's on the Y, temperature's on the X. You guys remember this one? We had the triple point and then we had critical point. And then for water, we had this, we had a negative slope. Most substances, this is a positive slope. Most substances, if you increase pressure, they go from a solid to a, or from a liquid to a solid. And we can label our phases here, solid, liquid, gas. So we dealt a lot with what happens when you, if you're at a certain pressure, let's say this is one atmosphere. So standard pressure. If you increase the temperature of a solid, you hit a point where it goes from a solid to a liquid, right? It's all seeming familiar. And then once you get to a liquid phase, if you keep increasing the temperature, you go from a liquid to a gas. What if we dropped the pressure though? If this is one atmosphere, what happens if we started at half an atmosphere instead? Well, at a low enough temperature, it's still a solid, but as we increase the temperature, we don't go through a, a liquid phase at all, do we? So most compounds and, and elements, um, not most, all, will have a, a pressure temperature range where you can't find it as a liquid. And so that's what this third process is, where you can go straight from a solid to a gas, what's known as sublimation. And depending on who you ask, though the verb of that is sublimate or sublime, but then sublime gets confused with, you know, the punkish reggae band from the 90s. Um, and or the description of art as sublime. So sublimation and sublimate, say a substance will sublimate, um, just to avoid confusion there. Um, have you ever seen sublimation happening in everyday life? You have, you might not know it, but you live up here in the mountains. Frost is the opposite of sublimation. That's which we call deposition. But have you, have you ever seen um, ice disappear from your driveway despite never getting above freezing? On a day that it never gets above freezing, you wind up with less ice at the end of the day than you had at the beginning of the day? Yeah, that's sublimation. Um, or if you've ever taken a, a um, ice cube tray, if you leave it in the freezer for a really, really long time, like, I don't know if you have like one of those, the, you know, the funny shaped ones or, that you hardly ever use, they sit in your, in your freezer at home forever. Maybe that's just at my house. Um, but then eventually you go and you get them and they've like shrunk inside the ice cube tray. That's sublimation as well, right? They, they're not like that when you first put them in there, you have to wait for it to, to sublimate for a bit. Yeah. Freeze drying is a two-step process, so I'd have to look at it more carefully. Um, but it's it's similar. Freeze drying, you remove the water, and I don't know if you remove if you can remove it by if they remove it by sublimation or other means. Probably sublimation, though. Um, you can do some funny things with phase change if you manipulate where you start and where you end on this graph, right? So for instance, um, dry ice sublimates. It doesn't evaporate because CO2, the triple point for CO2 is at like four atmospheres. So at one atmosphere, you can't get liquid CO2. 
So what you get instead is you get dry ice that just evaporates off. And that actual the cloud that comes off of dry ice is actually just the moisture in the air um, freezing and kind of going through a cloud formation because the dry ice gets cold that cold. Um, and interestingly enough, do you know how, how they make dry ice? If you make dry ice, it pretty much, it's pretty easy. Um, for dry ice, you basically, you start with a sam sample of CO2 gas that's about here on, on the phase diagram, and you literally just increase the pressure. We make, we make water ice by cooling it down, right, and letting it get cold. So that'd be a horizontal line, right? But if you change the pressure instead of the temperature, you get a vertical line. So literally, if you take CO2 and you put it into a container and you and then you just crush it um, down, you make dry ice. We actually used to do this in the lab that because we didn't use dry ice all that much. They had this like it's kind of like a piston that you could hook up to a um, to a CO2 tank. And then but the piston was on a screw on like a vice. And so you literally just filled up this this container with CO2 and you spun the vise until it crushed the piston down and you made, you know, a little cake of dry ice. Um, really, really low tech, but you have to know how this works to get there, right? Turns out engineers and scientists can be, can be rather clever if you give them, if you give them a reason to be. Um, all right, so to go along with these phase changes, we also have an accompanying change in energy. Um, and a lot of times so they're represented, so it turns out there's, there's lots of different kinds of energy. And so without getting into the, um, the specific derivations of what makes it free energy versus enthalpy versus entropy, um, which we'll get to some of that eventually. But for now, just know that delta H, that H is an energy term um, that's, that stands for enthalpy. I'll write that up there because it's kind of a weird word. And enthalpy is, you can think of enthalpy as just being the, the energy that's being stored in chemical bonds. So remember how we talked about the energy being stored in chemical bonds and that's what your body actually turns into kinetic energy. Um, so enthalpy is basically potential energy at the molecular level. And we're not going to spend too much time with it at this point or the difference between delta H versus delta E versus delta G or delta S. There's lots of different types of energy depending on what your conditions are. But typically, we look at, at reactions in terms of enthalpy change. And enthalpy is going to have, there's a couple different possibilities for units. It's not an energy term as in you're just going to get calories or joules out. Enthalpy is usually normalized by uh, either per gram or by per mole of a substance, right? So if you look at delta H effusion for water is given over there. So delta H effusion for water is 334 joules per gram. That's kind of an interesting unit. We like per units, right? Because we know how to use those like conversions, right? So what does this really tell us about water freezing? Gives us how much and a way to figure out how much energy that's going to take. If you have 20 grams of water freezing and every gram has this change in energy, we can figure out how much energy it's going to take or how much energy is given off. Um, but let's talk about the sign of that first. So if you start with liquid water, actually, so let's, let's do, 
Yeah, we'll do like uh, solid going to liquid. So H2O solid going to H2O liquid. Are we putting energy into the system or taking energy out of the system? I heard an out, I heard an in, and I heard an um. So let's think about this. So does it have more, does the water have more energy when it's a solid or when it's a liquid? Liquid. The, wa the molecules are moving around more, right? So we have to put energy in to get it to melt. So a lot of times with these delta H effusion or delta H of vaporization, it's not going to necessarily have a sign on it because the sign depends on whether you're going forward or backward. This reaction can happen both directions, right? We can have solid water turning into liquid or we can have liquid turning into a solid. And so whether or not it's a positive um, change in energy for the surroundings or a negative change in energy for the surroundings depends on whether or not we're starting at the low energy and going to the high energy or vice versa. All right, so if we have, I think I've cracked the problem next, again with my formatting. 15 grams of ice are, are added to a glass of water. How much energy does it take to convert all of the ice to water? Well, if you're used to using density as a conversion or speed as a conversion, this is a really, this is a one-step conversion, right? This is one of, there's, there's a lot of really, really simple equations in, in chemistry where you could memorize all the different various equations. Like there's an equation that says um, Q for the system equals delta H times the mass or something like that. And you could memorize that, all those various equations, or just pay attention to your units here and do everything like it's a conversion. So 15.0 grams of, of ice. For every one gram of ice, that's 334 joules absorbed. A lot of times what we're going to do to keep track of the sign on, on energy problems is we're going to use qualitative language to keep track of what's gaining energy and what's losing energy. So the ice is absorbing 334 joules per gram. So it winds up being, let's see, 5,000? Is that right? 5,000 what? 5,010. Well, that's an ambiguous number though, right? So if we're keeping track of our sig figs, we can either put it in scientific notation, um, which is not a bad way to do it, or you can uh, put it in kilojoules, right? Because then we would just be dividing by a thousand. So about five kilojoules. But since the next, the next problem has us doing a temperature change, equation in all of those we've been doing in joules, right? Not kilojoules really. So even though normally um, this would be really easy to put in kilojoules and not to worry about scientific notation, since we're going to turn around and use it as joules again, we might as well keep it in joules. Okay, well, now that we have an energy term, we know we can do some, some conversions and we can use our Q equation and we can figure out what temperature the, the glass of water is going to be. Let's say that we put, so I said 15 grams of ice seemed like a reasonable amount for a, a small to average ice cube. In 150 grams of water, 
you know, that's a coffee cup of water roughly. So these are relatively reasonable amounts. What's the final temperature of the water when the ice is done melting? Well, we have an energy term, right? We have an initial temperature for the water. We have a mass for the water. It's water, so we know the specific heat, right? What's the specific heat of water? Still 4.184. Turns out specific heat of ice is different, but as long as we're talking about liquid water, 4.184 is gonna keep coming back. And so if we know Q, is 5.01 times 10 to the three joules. And is that gonna be a positive number? And I'm gonna not say H2O because that I'm gonna say Q for the liquid. Is that positive or negative? Is the liquid water gaining or losing energy? Which that, Makes sense, right? It's weird to think about you have to add energy to the ice to melt it. But the idea that when you put ice in water and it melts, your water gets colder. We're used to that, right? So that should make some amount of sense. So if the if the ice is gaining water, the liquid water is losing the same amount of energy. So we've got Q. We've got CP. Four point one eight four joules per mole Kelvin or joules. Nope, but not joules per mole Kelvin. That's my other class. Joules per gram degree Celsius. What else do we have from our Q equation? We want to find the final temperature. So what else do we need? We need initial temperature, which is currently written as, as Fahrenheit, just to give us more practice converting Fahrenheit and Celsius. But that's annoying. It's good practice. What else are we going to need? One last piece. Final temperature is what we're looking for. Who said it? Mass of water, mass of the liquid water specifically, which was 150 grams. So the new step for this problem, the new step was just the idea of using enthalpy of fusion as a conversion. That was actually the easier math, right? The more complicated algebra is just the same thing we've done before. We're going to want Fahrenheit into Celsius, but that's not too hard as long as we watch our sig figs, right? 60.0 Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths TC plus 32. Remember that those are both exact numbers. So we're going to wind up with 28.0 when we subtract the 32. And then dividing by nine fifths is the same as multiplying by five ninths, right? So with three sig figs, our, did I do that math right? That seems too low. I guess that's right. <clears throat> what do we get for, for our temperature in Celsius? Say a little louder, 15.6. That does sound reasonable now. Just looking at the math made it seem like it, it's gonna be too small. <clears throat> so now we have all of our variables all in the right units. We plug it into our Q equation, solve for TF. 5.01 times 10 to the third. Joules equals 150 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
times TF minus 15.6. Or we can just solve for delta T and figure out the final temperature um, in an extra step. If that's easier to keep track of the sig figs, probably is. Definitely easier to plug into the calculator. 5,010 divided by 150 is going to give 33.4 times 4. So we're going to get something like 100. No, can't be right. Oh, divided by 4. 23. We slip a digit somewhere? That seems too high. Oh, 30. Yeah, so this is a negative. That's going to get us 33, not, yeah, 33 divided by 4. So what's, was it, were you giving me the final temperature or the delta T? Uh, that, the that would make more sense. Delta T winds up being negative 7 point what? And it's remember that it's a negative. Keeping track of the negative with these, it's relatively straightforward as long as you always go back to, does that make sense? I put a piece of ice in cold in room temperature water, it should get colder, right? <clears throat> so wind up with our TF is 15.6 minus 8.0. So 7.6 degrees Celsius. And remember, because our initial temperature only has the uncertainty in the tenths place, when we, even though we got to keep three sig figs on our delta T, when we do the subtraction, we're going to wind up rounding to the tenths place. So we wind up with 7.6 Celsius. Does that sound reasonable for one cube of ice in room temperature water? That, that doesn't, maybe a little bit surprising that it's that effective, frankly, but for one gram of ice or one cube of ice that is a tenth the size of the water, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. Turns out it takes a lot of energy to convert ice to water. It takes even more energy to convert water into steam. Um, so it actually winds up being, that's one of the reasons why we put ice in drinks rather than just put it in the refrigerator. It actually is way more effective at, and way faster to cool things down if you add ice to it because melting the ice takes so much energy from the surroundings. Plus there's one interesting fact about phase change. When a substance is going through a phase change, it stays the same temperature while it's going through that phase change, which is a little bit weird um, because it seems like that can't be true, right? If you put an ice cube in, in warm water, the whole, the whole thing of water doesn't stay at zero Celsius until the ice cubes melted, right? It's an ongoing process. But for the sake of, of being able to do the math, we can basically say all of the ice, all of the water that was the ice cube, all stays the same temperature as long as the ice cube is melting. Or the other way you can think about it is if you get the whole system to the same temperature, as long as there's still ice melting in that system, then everything in that system is zero Celsius. So if, if you've ever wondered why, why restaurants 
fill up um, cups the way they do with their ice. Like they're not just trying to short you on the soda. They don't want to short you on the soda because soda's cheap, right? They're doing that because as long as there's still ice in your cup, it's the same temperature. It's a nice, pleasant zero degrees Celsius. So it makes it really easy for our servers that don't don't want to have to keep coming back or get complaints about that my soda is getting warm or anything like that. They just fill it all up with ice. And as long as there's still ice there, you're good to go, which is kind of cool. Um, the way we represent that is what, with what's called a cooling curve. And so a cooling curve basically plots the temperature of a system versus the amount of energy in or out. Um, so sometimes you see heating curves or cooling curves that referring to are you adding energy in or taking energy out? It's the same thing, but in opposite direction, right? If you start with steam at say it's 125 Celsius and you start cooling it down, if you start pulling energy out of it, it goes down at a constant rate until you hit a phase change. When the water starts condensing, it'll stay at the same temperature until all of it's condensed. And then once all the water is condensed and you keep taking energy out, temperature starts decreasing again until what? Until we hit the next phase change until we hit the point where it starts freezing. So this is 100, this would be zero Celsius. And once you hit zero Celsius, it all stays the same temperature again until all of it has frozen, at which point you can keep, the temperature can go down. And at that point, if you were able to keep taking energy out of it, you could in theory keep going until you hit absolute zero. There's no more phase changes really no more major phase changes as you get colder. <clears throat> so this is a useful tool, mostly because it shows us where the phase changes are. And also because this allows us to sort of organize our thoughts when it comes to figuring out how much energy a specific change is going to take. If I asked you, if I said, okay, you've got a, a piece of ice at, at zero Fahrenheit, call it, call it negative 20 Celsius. How much energy does it take to turn that piece of ice into, um, into liquid water at 20 Celsius? Well, there's three things that have to happen there, yeah. You could not because you have to get the ice colder. Turns out all we can get samples really close to zero Kelvin these days. So the the, the lowest boiling point known known to, I mean, known to man, I guess. Um, lowest boiling point on the periodic table is hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen boils at two Kelvin. Um, liquid helium boils at about four Kelvin. You to get colder than that you actually have to use a process called laser cooling, um, which is kind of like if you, um, when you stand out in the sun, you warm up because your body is absorbing sunlight, right? And then that turns that into extra extra vibrations in the molecules in your body or on your, your clothes. Um, turns out if you shift the wavelength of light just below where something is supposed to absorb, it's kind of like slowing someone down on a swing. If somebody's swinging really hard back and forth, you can put more energy in to make them swing higher, right? If you time your pushes, right? But if you time your pushes a little differently, you can get them to slow down by kind of absorbing the energy from them when they come towards you instead of putting more energy in. Turns out we can tune the wavelengths on lasers to do that. So we can actually get samples down to like a tenth of a, tenth of a Kelvin um, we can't really get past that. And ice won't get us there because we're starting from, you know, whatever the temperature of your, your freezer is. Um, but so the reason that a 
a heating curve though, it winds up being useful is because it, it does allow us to say, okay, here I'm going through a temperature change. So I have to use my Q equation. Here I'm going through a phase change. So I have to use my, del find the delta H for that substance, for that phase transition. Right. And then, so if I said, okay, then here's negative 20 and I'm trying to get to, I don't know, water at 40 degrees Celsius. To figure out how much energy that whole process takes, we have three steps. We have heat the ice up until it goes through a phase change. Then we have the phase change. And then we have heating up the liquid water. So these heating curves allow us to keep track of that so that we can answer these more complicated energy questions. Like if you have a residential freezer, it's about negative 23 Celsius, how much energy does it take to change the temperature of a 25 gram of ice from negative 23 Celsius to zero Celsius? And then we can figure out how much energy it takes to melt that ice once it reaches zero Celsius. And then how much energy does it take to go from zero to 21 Celsius, i.e. room temperature. That's this three-step process. Figure out where you start on the, your heating curve. You don't need to draw the heating curve every time, but it helps to, to label what you're going to do. What step are you trying to calculate? Because we have two different possibilities when something's changing temperature or going through a phase change, right? It's either going to use our Q equation or it's going to use an enthalpy of fusion or an enthalpy of vaporization. And we're going to figure out how many grams we have and use that like a conversion. So the first one's first part's really easy, right? And the last part's really easy. Those are both just temperature change problems, right? We've done enough of those at this point. That's pretty straightforward. In this case, we know the delta T for both of those. We know the specific heat. We know the mass. We're just trying to get Q. And so a lot of times we'll label the different different energy values as um, just sequentially. The first thing that happens is you take the cold ice and you get it to zero Celsius. So our Q1 is going to be 25 grams, different specific heat, like I mentioned for ice, 2.11 joules per gram degree Celsius times, what's our delta T? 23, positive 23. And while we're using our Q equation, we might as well do figure out the energy for the third step. We replace these with the numbers that we're using for this problem. So it was minus 23 Celsius up to zero Celsius, and then from zero Celsius to 21. So Q3, still 25 grams of ice, or it's not ice anymore. It's now liquid water, but there's still 25 grams of it, right? Yeah. Now we're using 4.184 because we're doing liquid water. And then we're going plus 21 degrees Celsius. What do we get for a number for Q1? Fifty times twenty-three, something about about a thousand, fifteen hundred joules, or my two? No, that's about right. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Just two, because of the 23 Celsius, right? If it said 23.0 to zero Celsius, we can we can assume that the zero Celsius, we call that a, a um, 
um, an exact number because that's the definition of zero Celsius, the point where water melts. But either way, we'll still only get to keep two sig figs, so call it 1.2 kilojoules. Because it was 1,200, divide by 1,000 to get it in kilojoules, and then we don't have to do scientific notation. Q3, it's a little bit weird to think about the fact that liquid water takes more than twice as much energy to change its temperature as, um, as ice does. That's a little unexpected, maybe. At least seems weird to me when I think about it. It's still just water, right? But we should get something roughly double this, right? Maybe close to 2.5 kilojoules. 2002 2.2 kilojoules gets us from zero Celsius up to to 21 Celsius room temperature. So what's our last step then? If we want to find we're looking for the total energy to go all the way from negative 23 up to positive 21. Add them together, we also have this second, this step two though, right? We didn't take into account that it has to melt as well. It's at zero Celsius, which means, and it's not changing temperature, which means we're not using this equation. We have to use that delta H of fusion, which is three, 334 joules per gram. And all three of these steps have to happen. You've got to warm your ice up to zero Celsius. You have to melt the ice, and then you have to melt. You have to warm the liquid water up to room temperature. All right. So don't forget the step, the second step here. So we can call it Q two, even though we're not going to use our our Q equation. It's just going to be twenty five point zero grams. And it's not on the board. I just rewrote it. In every one gram is 334 joules. So you get something like a thousand, ten thousand. 8,350 or 8.35. 8 we do get to keep an extra sig fig in this one because there's no temperature change. 8.35 kilojoules. So all three of our steps together, that's our Q total, our total Q our total energy that we have to put into the ice or into that sample to get it all the way from negative 23 up to positive 21 is the sum of all three steps. So even more so than the fact that it, it's weird that it takes twice as much energy to warm up water, it's also really weird that it takes almost four times as much energy to melt the ice. So for the phase for the phase changes, there is no temperature change. They stay at the same temperature. And so anytime you've got a reaction happening or a phase change happening, you're not looking at this because you're not changing the temperature of your water. You're it's you're just getting it, putting in energy just to get it to go through the phase change. It's weird that it stays at a constant temperature where it's going through the phase change. It takes getting used to. That's why this graph is kind of helpful because we can actually, we can make this graph. We can take a sample. It's, it's not the most thrilling lab. If you thought that the lab yesterday was kind of boring, heat up metal, watch it change the temperature. Um, the lab where, where my Gen Chem students make a heating curve, they make this graph themselves. 
uh, is literally watching water boil, right? They sit there and they watch the temperature and they say, oh, every 30 seconds, they take, make a note of the temperature and then they put it into Excel and they can wind up watching, okay, here it's raising in temperature and then it flattens out. There's where our phase change happens. Then it starts going up again. Oh, my, all of the ice must have melted. Um, and every substance does this, but the fact that it's going through the phase change means that you're putting energy in and all of the extra energy is not, that energy that you're putting in is not going to make it to heating it up. It's just going to melt the ice. Right? And this is the amount of energy you have to put in to get there. And the, the enthalpy of uh, vaporization for water is, uh, I want to say it's like five times bigger than that. It takes a lot of energy to go through phase changes. So if I was drawing this to scale, the flat regions would be way longer than they are or the slopes would have to be way steeper than they are. But in general, that's how we're going to approach phase changes. You're going to need a delta H value for a phase change. And depending on the units, it can be in joules per gram or it can be in joules per mole sometimes as well. Once we define what a mole is and how to use that, that would make more sense. And that's what the number was. All right. Um, this is just more practice with the same problem, but we have another way of looking at it too. Um, this is just almost the same. Same. I think I usually wind up with these on being on separate days. I end class with one of the examples, and then we do the uh, the same thing with a different mass the next day. Um, so we won't go through that one right now because it's literally the exact same thing we just did. All right, so let's look at some phase diagrams. A um, little bit hard to see these. You know, we'll just do this on the quiz. We'll just do that on the quiz rather than go through it now, um, just because it's hard to make up the details. At least for my eyes, you guys can't read the scale very well, can you? In the back, yeah. Are your eyes still sharp enough? No. You can read it, okay? Okay. Um. So let's say at our elevation, water boils around ninety-four Celsius. A sample of ice at zero Celsius is heated until it melts and becomes steam at ninety-four Celsius. Which of these heating curves matches that description? Multiple choice questions, right? And if you're in a science class, you may have figured out how to take multiple choice tests, but remember it's always about process of elimination, right? With a multiple choice test, especially something as qualitative as this, don't necessarily, you don't need to look for the right answer, just eliminate the ones that are obviously wrong. It says it starts at zero Celsius and we're adding energy to it. So only graphs that start at zero Celsius should be should we even consider, right? That eliminates two right off the bat, doesn't it? It can't be this one because that's starting below zero Celsius, and it can't be this one because that's starting above zero Celsius. Every time I go near that TV, it does something. Um, so is it B or C? Why? <laughs> because it says steam at 94 Celsius. So the fact that it's ending once you turn it all into steam means it's got to be C. If I said then, and then you keep heating it up afterwards, then it could be B because you're starting at zero, getting through your, going through a phase change, getting to your next phase change, and then you keep going. So all of these have the same general shape to them. It's just a matter of where you start and where you end. Yeah. Wait, 
So it did not specify that C is um, all the way at the end. If we we're doing this experimentally and we wanted to be sure that all of our liquid water had boiled off, we would wait until the temperature started to go up again. Yeah. Past that, and then we cut it right there. Um, but the other option is going up all the way past 135 Celsius. Out of these choices, I would say C is the better choice. Okay. But again, if I ever write a multiple choice test uh, or a multiple choice problem and you need you think to justify your decision between your last two choices you want to write a little note i can give partial credit for that that's the only way i can give partial credit for multiple choice tests right is if if i know something about the thinking that went into it because if you just guess at stuff i'm not going to give you partial credit for guessing show me you put some thought into it and you can get partial or full credit if you explain it well enough i mean if you just guess if you guess it right then you guessed it right um, you get full credit. I'm not going to not give you credit on a multiple choice question. I also, I barely ever write multiple choice chess questions because it feels so weird grading them. Um, giving people that may have guessed full credit when somebody who got 90% of the way there doesn't get full credit. Um, so I don't usually do those except on the quizzes just because they're really fast to grade on the quizzes. Um, all right, so questions about phase change in energy. Cool, then we're gonna leave energy for, for a little bit. And we're gonna go back to atomic theory. All right, does everybody remember atomic theory vaguely? At least what it, what it was, kind of? It was Dalton, right? And you put together those three, three natural laws and basically figured out that everything is made out of Lego pieces and they're all, all, they're all interchangeable within the same element. And all you really do is rearrange them. Um, and we, we immediately, coming from the 20th century, were able to poke some holes in some parts of that, right? Um, but one we didn't really discuss is tiny and indestructible particles called atoms. If everything is made of tiny indestructible particles called atoms, that means that the ad an atom is as small as you can go, right? You can't have anything smaller than an atom, which is from our 20th century lens. We know that that's not true. What's smaller than an atom? Well, there's quarks, there's protons, neutrons, electrons. Those are the ones we're going to go with. I don't know much about quarks. Subatomic physics is not, not my strong suit. Um, I know a little bit about elementary particles like that, but I'm not, not great at it. So we're going to stick mostly to what the fundamental subatomic particles. Um, but let's talk just in the last 15 minutes about um, how they figured out that there had to be things smaller than that. Again, we know what a, that there's an electron, that they exist, right? Because we use electricity all the time. And we have some idea of what protons and neutrons and electrons are. Um, even somebody who's never taken a chemistry class, they might not be able to tell you what an electron is, but they know what, that electrons exist, right? So, but going back to, the 1700s, as now we're, this is crossing into the early 1800s. Um, this Thompson, I think, a guy named Thompson figured out that if you, if you take all of the air out of a glass tube, make what's called a vacuum tube, and you put a piece of metal at each end, if you apply a voltage to those, to those at the ends there, um, he found what he called cathode rays. And those cathode rays, they call them cathode rays because it looked like they came from the cathode of this system. Um, he said that they travel in straight lines, they have a negative charge, neither of which those weren't that groundbreaking. The groundbreaking part was at a mass that was about 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen. 
Well, how can that be? Hydrogen's the very smallest element and nothing is smaller than an atom, right? So this was the first time they poked holes in Dalton's theory. Dalton's theory lasted the way he wrote it as for, I don't know, maybe 20 years. Um, so, I mean, he still, still really made fundamental changes and really, really brilliant guy, but not very long before ever the scientific community is like, well, but what about this? Um, I mean, scientists are famous for being the, well, actually types of, of the world, right? Well, you didn't take this into account. Um, and so Thompson figured out that these, these cathode rays, they had a mass and they were identical no matter what material was used. So his conclusion that he was able to come up with is atoms have smaller pieces. Right. And again, they keep going smaller and smaller these days. Now there's quarks, there's um, bosons versus fermions. And if you look at the universal model for, or the, sorry, the standard model um, of physics, you can look at the very, very smallest fundamental particles of all, all these different types. Um, we're going to stop at, at the stuff that's immediately below atoms. Um, and this, this caused a big stir for a couple of reasons. One, it amended the atomic theory, but also if these are negative, but atoms are neutral, what else must there be? There has to be something to balance out the charge, right? So this was, so not only did Thompson discover electrons, he also provided the first evidence for protons. He didn't know it at the time. And so that led to what was called the plum pudding model. Um, the plum pudding model basically was the idea that if you've got these atoms and the, the electrons are sort of embedded in the atoms, but if you, if you apply enough, enough voltage to it, you can get those electrons to fly out of, the, of that mass. Has anybody ever seen a plum pudding? I don't have a picture here right now. If you look up plum pudding, it's a British dessert. It, and I don't like cooked food, so it's, it sounds disgusting to me. Um, and it looks even worse. It's like, it's not even pastry. It's like bread. It's like fruit cake. It's a fruit cake. It, they call it a pudding because because the British call anything that you have for dessert is a pudding. Yeah, otherwise, it's not really a pudding. It's like a fruit cake. Um, and that might not be exactly true because they also have weird stuff like blood pudding and stuff like that too. It's definitely not a dessert. Um, again, if you live in Northern Europe and you start to starve as, as the winter goes on, you come up with really creative ways to get protein, like um, not letting any bit of the animal go to waste. So you make plump, you make blood pudding. Um, they serve it as a, it's a breakfast dish now. Sounds appetizing, right? Um, anyway, plum pudding model, plum pudding model. Let's focus on the model, get back. Um, because this is a really cool thing that happened. This is really science the way science is supposed to work. Um, a guy named Rutherford. So Thompson, the guy who invented or who, who discovered the electrons, um, he realized that that means that there, this was the, the model he came up with was the plum pudding model. And one of his students, a guy named Rutherford, um, said, okay, well, I'm going to design an experiment that's going to provide a more supporting evidence to show that the plum pudding model is correct. Um, and so what he did is he took, he took gold and he, and he made a foil of gold that was so thin that you could see through it. So that's gold foil that's basically only a few atoms thick. And his thinking was, if you take this gold foil and you fire, you fire some high energy particles at it, um, you can measure the speed of the particles before and after, and they sh it should slow down as it moves through the plum pudding. And so Rutherford tried that experiment. He made a gold foil, a gold foil. he used a radioactive source of on what they call alpha particles, which are basically a helium nucleus, but re moving really, really fast and with no electrons. And when he threw those alpha particles at the gold foil, almost all of them went straight through and hit the other side at the same speed that he started with. 
which was really weird. Totally counteracted what he was trying to what he was trying to prove. And again, like he must have had some tense discussions with with Thompson, his advisor, um, because Thompson was the one who was came up with the plum pudding model. And so, and now all of a sudden, his his own student is disproving it because the plum pudding model can't be true based on what he discovered here. So Rutherford was the one who came up with the the nuclear theory. And the nuclear theory is that almost all of the mass of, a new, of an atom is concentrated in one tiny spot in the middle. It's called the nucleus. And the positive charge is concentrated in the nucleus. And the nucleus has a discrete, meaning a whole number, um, number of protein, protons, an integer number of protons. And then the electrons are spread around the outside and they balance out the charge to make it neutral. Right? And this matched with what Rutherford saw because almost all of his alpha particles went straight through with no change. But if it happened that one of those alpha particles happened to get too close to the nucleus, it would fire off at a random angle. Well, not truly random, it turns out, but um, seemingly random at the time. And the only way that that could happen is if almost all that positive charge was in one spot. Right. So I like that story because that's how science is supposed to work. Um, there's a guy named Karl Popper who wrote a lot about the philosophy of science and he wrote in the 20th century um, and he came up with, with the term um, falsifiable not falsifiable like you can make something seem untrue but if you're doing science properly you have to give the theory that you're trying to provide evidence for you have to give that theory a chance to fail right and so rutherford's experiment was perfect for that because he, had, he expected one result but he was ready to measure if something else happened and basically he disproved the plum pudding model that's all science really does we don't prove things in science all we do is disprove things. And when you disprove things, whatever left is closer to the truth than the, what you had before. Right? And so, which is really, really frustrating. Nothing is ever proven in science. It's just not disproven. Which is also kind of weird. Um, all right. We'll start, we'll pick up no, we have no uh, time to do one, one or two more slides. All right, so this is how we finally got to atomic number and protons and electrons, right? Because up to this point, periodic table existed-ish. Mendeleev, we talked about Mendeleev, right? Okay, um, the Russian one that nobody liked. Um, yeah, Mendeleev had figured out that if you put the periodic table, if you, if you arrange the elements, in order um, of, he said, by mass, um, Rutherford and the nuclear theory is what was needed to figure out that we should actually arrange them by number of protons. Mendeleev didn't know what a proton was, so it's not, not his fault um, per se, but once you know, and now we're figuring out what protons are, Rutherford, now we're getting into the end of the 18th century. We're now getting close to quantum stuff. In fact, a lot of this is what led to that because once they started noticing electrons and how weird electrons behave, that's kind of what led to the research into quantum mechanics. Um, and so this is what, how we define things and what, what you see on the periodic table. We have different elements and we define our elements by the atomic number. All right, so in the, the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. That's the definition. That's how you tell one element from another. It's not the mass. It's not any other properties. It's how many protons are there. Um, these first three, the element name, the atomic number, and the atomic symbol are all more or less interchangeable if you have a periodic table with you. 
because the element name and the atomic symbol, symbol always mean exactly the same thing. We just write them di differently depending on whether we're writing something out or if we're trying to abbreviate it in the formula. Um, and the, But the element identity is defined by how many protons it has. Right, so let's, um, well, I'll put out an announcement for this as well, but this is going to be one of the very few things that I say, hey, trust me, you need to memorize this, um, is going to be the atomic symbols and names. Not like where they are on the periodic table, not, not like any of the numbers associated with them, just Cu equals copper, silver equals Ag. Right, so um, we'll do, let's say a week from Monday, we'll do a quiz. Um, closed book, we'll cover up the periodic table over there and the ones on your desks. I know, but this is the last time I'm gonna take your periodic table away from you. After this, you always get your periodic table because it, it would take too long to communicate. It's like trying to talk to somebody if they have to look up every word in a translating dictionary, right? So memorize it, get it down, and then I'm never going to take your, your periodic table away. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures and the